Welcome to this YDS video series, Transformational Leadership in a Turbulent Time, an extension of the Transformational Leadership Program at Yale Divinity School, featuring interviews with leaders in church and society, reflecting on their work during this pandemic with an eye to what will change when life gets back to what we will think of as normal. In this program, Matt Hotho, the Director of Worship Technologies at the Hyde Park United Methodist Church in Tampa, Florida, talks with MDiv student Monica Largesse about how a congregation that was already technologically sophisticated has been changed and transformed during this time of being physically apart and shares some ideas about what's been learned and what will change in the technological ministry of churches after the pandemic ends. For the next video in the series, the Reverend Tyler Sitt, who started the New City Church in Minneapolis, talks about church planting among younger adults who haven't spent much time in churches. In his conversation with MDiv student Jonathan Lee, you'll hear about the strategies during and after the pandemic for building a justice-focused and inclusive church. The third video in the, video in the series this spring features YDS alum Nicole Perone, recently appointed as a national coordinator of the ESTEEM program at the Roman Catholic Leadership Roundtable, promoting best practices and accountability in the Catholic Church. Nicole has quickly become a significant leader in the Catholic Church and a trusted voice who envisions the future. Finally, in the fourth video in this series, you'll meet Pastor Gabby Kudjo Wilkes, a YDS grad and founding leader of Double Love Experience, a worshiping, thinking, loving, justice-oriented community in Brooklyn and beyond. You'll hear about that dynamic ministry that's been both an in-person worship gathering and a broadcast worship experience that both before the pandemic and throughout the last year has drawn lay folks and plenty of clergy from around the country. You'll want to see why. Then on Sunday, April 11th, the Leadership in a Time of Crisis series will feature a live conversation with the Reverend Starsky Wilson, the new president of the Children's Defense Fund in Washington, D.C. He'll be in conversation with the Reverend Joanne Jennings, the director of the YDS Black Church Studies Program. We hope that you'll follow the whole series and that the ideas exchanged will encourage you in your own leadership during this difficult time. Hopefully the autumn of 2021, we'll see the return of a live transformational leadership program at YDS. Keep an eye on our website for those details. <laughs> Welcome to Yale's series on le transformational leadership in a turbulent time. I'm Monica Largis and I'm here today with Matt Hotho. He is the Director of Worship Technologies at Hyde Park United Methodist Church in Tampa, Florida, where he also has worked as the Director of Small Groups. He has an MDiv from Candler School of Theology at Emory University. And in 2020, we worked together on a project where he was the executive producer of his church's podcast, The Bible Project 2020. He lives in Clearwater, Florida with his family. His wife, Emily, is also a UMC pastor with three sons, Liam, Evan, and Jackson. Welcome. Thank you for coming today, Matt. Thanks, Monica. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's great. So can you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do at the church? Uh, yeah, so you gave a great introduction. I mean, that pretty much covers uh, most of what I do, with the exception of maybe an occasional bit of crossfitting in there occasionally, <laughs> uh, less so during the pandemic. But um, yeah, so I mean, my job at Hyde Park, this director of worship technology, is uh, really like pre COVID, it was what you would think a director of worship technology would do. I was, you know, teaching people to run sound, run lights, you know, capture live stream video for our for our online audience. Um, I would set up for outside events that we had. You know, mm -hmm. I was teaching people to run uh, cables, set up sound systems, troubleshoot sound systems. It was actually really cool. I had a volunteer team of about 50 people that I was kind of training and learning and we were trying to move towards new things. And then uh, like many of us um, on March 15th, that was the first Sunday that we went virtual. Um, mm -hmm. And my job completely changed. The first two weeks, I thought, eh, you know, we can probably just live stream this thing. And so we had cameras set up. We were just literally at 930. We went live. The pastor was on stage. You know, there was a, a single vocalist in the room singing, uh, 
traditional. We did, so we had contemporary at 9.30, traditional at 11, and we did that for two weeks. And then we quickly realized that, um, that I think we could do more. Th this was affording us an opportunity to do something more. And my job fundamentally changed after that day um, because we started producing our services instead of streaming our services. And that's a subtle mm -hmm. distinction. But what it meant is we were basically recording everything ahead of time. The pastor's sermon, the, uh, the musical elements, the hosting elements, the prayers, the scriptures, all that would be recorded ahead of time. And then streamed up to the internet and then broadcast at 9 30 and 11 on sunday mornings and that's what we're doing today that's what my job basically consists of today it's grown quite a bit because uh we've changed the way we do it and so we uh we're, we're, we're improving upon it we, you know we, we we are continually improving our systems and the quality of the content that we put out uh and so yeah my job has just been really fluid for the last nine <laughs> ten months um haven't really had much of a vacation haven't really had much <laughs> yeah. of a break uh but and maybe we can talk about that more when it comes to leadership um and you know one one thing that's weird i'm just kind of teeing up a few things about leadership that we might get to later mm -hmm. is that um uh, the team that i worked with that team of 50 um i haven't seen many of them in the last 10 months which is kind of sad my team's changed quite a bit um, i'm starting just now 10 to 11 months in bringing new volunteers on board uh, because it took a while to get the systems worked out, to get everything kind of tweaked that I felt like I could teach somebody the process. We didn't really have a process for a while. Um, so it was really me and a couple other staff members working for the first like 10 months, putting this yeah. thing together. So I lost some of that camaraderie that I had had with lay people, but got more of a camaraderie with some staff. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting thing when your job description changes so much through a year and it, it almost is a mismatch of the original idea. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, in fact, I, this is, might be a leadership kind of, uh, sometimes I'll throw out these little, uh, what do I call them? Like little, like, uh, uh, I don't know, life pro tips, you know, yes. life pro tips, LPTs, <laughs> right? Life pro tips. Um, I always keep a copy of my job description on the desktop of my computer and I'm constantly updating it oh. because what's interesting about that is let's say you mm. want to go talk to your boss about a raise or another leadership opportunity or maybe the organization is sort of changing a little bit and you can sort of have a sheet of paper there that's ready to kind of say hey here's what i do how might this fit into our organization uh, or if you know you're ready to move on to another job opportunity you've actually your job description is somewhat a resume like it's kind of getting your resume it I'm kind sure. of helps you yeah. think through what you would say on a resume or what you would say in a job interview so I mean, I don't update it weekly, but I would say every six months to a year, I will open that document and go, what is my actual job right now? So in fact, that job description before COVID didn't say director of worship technologies. It now says uh, multi-site director of production because we had opened a second campus when mm -hmm. after I started my job. And really my job is more multi-site. Does that mean that I think of myself as a multi-site director of production? Not necessarily, but I think if our organization were to think through what the ways they had me leading before COVID, I think that would be a helpful document to talk yeah. about with them. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That may, that's it. Thanks for the pro tip. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'll throw a few more of those out, you know, LPTs. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have uh, so many does, questions. It does that. weird out. It does weird out your coworkers though, when you share your screen oh. in a meeting and they're like, why is your job description on your desktop? <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. I yeah. can see that. Yeah. Well, being in an MDiv program, it seems like there's so, so many things that I love learning in an MDiv program that seem really different from what you're actually doing. Do you feel like your education has helped you do it well? That's a great question. So I think the MDiv program um, almost makes you think you know too much. <laughs> like I came out of seminary feeling like I had a lot of the answers to the theological questions that people would ask. Yeah. But I didn't always know how to leverage that knowledge in leadership. And I don't mean leverage it to like take advantage of someone. Sure. What, what I mean is so, so I, I, I heard this quote by Jim Collins earlier this week, actually. It was uh, maturing leaders try to be the dumbest person in the room. Hmm. And if you think about it, I definitely came out of seminary trying to be the smartest person in the room, right? <laughs> like, but I was also trying to be like, coy about it. I had worked yeah. at a large church in Atlanta and they will always tell you like, you know, a lot of people will say, 
oh, don't go into a church and say, when I used to work here, when I used to work there, yeah. you know. So I thought, yeah, that's good advice. So I would always say, well, I've heard that at some churches they do this, you know, or someone I used to know tried this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I it, I was always trying to be the smartest person in the room. I feel like I had all the answers. And I'm, I'm wondering if a growth edge for me, and, and this isn't something that we're taught in an MDiv program necessarily. I mean, the fact that you're doing a, a video podcast on this or a vodcast, what do they even call it? I don't know. A I vlog. Guess. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> a vlog on this content is huge because I think as MDivs, we don't get enough of this stuff. Um, yeah. Is that, you know, when, when you get in those conversations, you're going to be tempted to say, no, I am. You, and you might be the smartest person in the room. I mean, y'all went to Yale. So y'all are pretty smart to get into Yale. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, but, uh, but sometimes it helps to be the, to not start with that. So by being the yeah. dumbest person in the room, what that means is like, you're going to ask questions. You're going to ask clarifying questions. What I hear you saying is this, can you tell me more about why you think that, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So to your question about, you know, what did I learn in an MDiv program? I didn't, I don't feel like I learned that in the MDiv program. If anything, um, I was really competitive in my MDiv program, right? I wanted oh. to be the smartest person. <laughs> I wanted to get that 104 on the Hebrew exam. Oh, you know, fantastic. like I wanted to impress the TA. I wanted to mm -hmm. be the research assistant. You know, I wanted mm -hmm. to be doing all these cool things. Um, and that's cool if you want to work in academia for the rest of your life and mm -hmm. wrestle with imposter syndrome for the rest of your life, yeah. uh, which let's be honest, we all still do. Um, yeah. But in uh, in the local church, sometimes uh, I felt like I needed to um, read up more on leadership. I needed to be actively seeking to lead myself every day and pour leadership resources into myself so that I could be a, the best leader I could be um, once I left the MDiv program. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. And I think some of our, like you said, doing something like this or our internships can be helpful with that too, education wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's nothing like experience. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Um, an evaluated experience. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's one thing to have experience. It's another thing to have experience where you're able to sit down with someone and go, how'd I do? You know, yeah. how did how did that come across? And maybe you might have somebody in your organization or when you get into an organization that you might trust uh, enough to have conversations like that. I was telling you, Monica, before we started recording that I had a rough week uh, this past week. I, I made some poor leadership choices. Yeah. Um, and one thing that was hard about going through that is I made those poor leadership choices late in the week. And so I didn't want to call the one person on staff that I would evaluate it with. Uh, over the weekend, I wanted to give her that space. I wanted to give myself that space, uh, but I'm really looking forward to this week, knowing that there's someone on that staff that I can call and say, hey, here's the three things that I really messed up last week. <laughs> can we talk about them? And she uses language like, let's have a coaching moment. You know, let's really think through this. And so I'm looking forward to kind of leaning into that relationship um, yeah. this week. Yeah, that's so helpful. So how would you define a leader? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a huge kind of question. Um, I think in, I think it's so contextual um, and it's so experiential. So for, I don't think there's one set definition of a leader. Um, I think there's multiple ways that people lead. Um, I, I, I think a leader is someone who is, uh, I guess I can give you qualities of a leader. I don't know if I can define what leadership is and maybe that means that i'm not the right guest for this podcast but <laughs> but i think I, I think i could like give qualities of a leader i think leaders are introspective um i think they're self-aware i think they uh are driven by values and they know those values mm. oh, i think yeah. leaders really healthy leaders have like a mission statement for themselves right they mm. know why they're doing what they do and what um, and what drives them to do that. I mean, think about, you know, today's MLK Day, right? Think yeah. about a leader like Martin Luther King, right? He had values. He had a cause. He had something that he was. Now, he was also a prophet and an activist. And not all leaders are called to be prophets and activists. Some leaders are called to lead their families. You know, some leaders are called to uh, just lead organizations. Um, but I think those... The things that leaders have are those things that I said earlier. You know, they they know themselves really well. They're introspective. They have a self mission statement, some values, some things that you know drive them towards what they do. 
Yeah. And anybody can be a leader. I think that's the big thing that um, that it took me a long time to learn. Uh, I always thought, when am I going to become a leader, right? Like, oh, when I turn 30, I'm going to be a leader. <laughs> Everybody talks about 33 is your Jesus year, right? When oh, you get yeah. to be a leader. <laughs> um, or I had in my head my Dietrich Bonhoeff year, Bonhoeffer year because I think he was 33 or 34 when he was yeah. killed by the Nazis yeah. or maybe a little bit older. But yeah. he had you know, obviously done amazing things with his life by his late twenties. And I was right. like, oh man, I haven't done that. Like I missed it. All right. There <laughs> was my leadership yeah. window and it closed. <laughs> right. Like yeah. I and and I think some of us who are who are gifted, who are high achievers, like we set ourselves up against these these um paramount figures. And then when we don't meet that, we automatically think that, well, it's not going to happen for us. I think the encouraging word for a lot of us um, who again, who are high achievers, who would be in a master's program, who would want to lead in the local church is that you are already a leader. And if you don't believe that, think about the things you do to lead yourself, right? The self-discipline that you have for yourself. And that might be a place for you to start working on your leadership is if your self-discipline isn't that good, a uh, mind kind of ebbs and flows. I could probably, yeah. you know, track it over the last like, you know, three to six months, especially during the pandemic. Yeah. How am I doing it leading myself? Right. Yeah. Um, but even if you're not that head leader that 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 point leader you can lead from the middle of an organization you know mm -hmm. you can lead as a young person um it it just takes that that self-awareness and that desire to uh to want to make things better and and helping to have conversations around that yeah definitely considering people have master's degrees in leadership i think that's a solid answer what is a leader <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so you've touched on this idea a little as you've aged. I mean, we're both sure. in our thirties, so we're not old, but as we've aged, I know it's taken a while for me to see myself as a leader and to understand that leadership is not necessarily the most charismatic person in the room or the yeah. most gregarious. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about how you view yourself as a leader now? Yeah. I mean, so right now I view myself <laughs> as a leader, uh, in, in terms of, uh, I, I feel like I have a very specific set of skills that uh, I get to, um, I control what happens sort of next with the iterations of our online experience at Hyde Park. Yeah. So when I think about um, ways that we can make it better, oftentimes people are looking to me for the ideas for, okay, what are the next steps we can do? Are we doing the right things? What is the next thing that we can do? And that doesn't mean that I now have permission to just make those decisions. It more so means that I'm being invited to lead those conversations and yeah. to speak into those conversations. Yeah. Um, because I sort of have the, the broadest sort of knowledge around how we do this. So when I lead then, you know, it's, it's thinking about um, how we change our services, how we improve them, how we change, how we offer them. I mean, there's so much I could get into about kind of just the technology side of doing online church and doing online ministry, um, which may be beyond the scope of this podcast. But I think the other way that I'm starting to lead right now is uh, something that I did a ton pre-COVID. And that's, I love, uh, some people call it replacing yourself, uh, yeah. mentoring, that kind of thing. I, so like last night we were doing a video shoot and uh, uh, I didn't, it was crazy. I didn't touch a single piece of equipment. Like, like there were three people running cameras yeah. and a volunteer doing the soundboard recording and I wrapped cables. I did what the, I typically did what the, like the grunt work is of just <laughs> wrapping cables. Um, that's what I did last night at a, at a six hour event everything else was covered because I had been kind of teaching people over the last six months, how to run cameras, how to frame shots, how to get things in focus, how to make motion happen, how to see through a camera. And then this other volunteer was running sound. He used to do live sound and I'd been teaching him how to do studio sound where you're basically capturing tracks to mix down later. And he has like gotten that down. Right. So that left me to wrap cables. That's actually is reminding me of, um, my youth director back in middle school and high school would always tell me that would talk about servant leadership. And I didn't understand what that meant. I always thought, well, I did understand what it meant. Like, you know, you're 
he would always be in the kitchen cleaning up after youth group, right? Mm -hmm. He would always be the one cleaning up, but he didn't always think about replacing himself. He was always the one still doing the talks and that kind of thing. But when it came to doing things that were messy, he was always the first one to jump in. That task that like was that nobody wanted to do, he was always wanting to jump in and do it. I think what I'm seeing in myself is that as I do this sort of more discipleship sort of leading, this mentoring sort of leading, I'm finding myself now, well, what's left to do? The stuff that is the lowest thing on the totem pole that helps everybody else succeed, right? And so I find myself in that position now, checking in with people, making sure they're doing you know what they need to do, being a resource for them to help them get better. Um, but it's a really neat place to be because it it doesn't, if I were to disappear tomorrow, there's a team of four people that could keep those music videos going. Or even better, Monica, if I were to take a two week vacation, there's a yeah. team of four people <laughs> who could keep that going, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, you're not like, your that's selfish. Yeah. But yeah, exactly, right? I'm like, sometimes when I think about, man, do I wanna take a vacation? Well, nobody knows how to put together the service yet that actually gets broadcast on Sunday, like the full uh, start of the service to the end of the service that I build in Adobe. Nobody else knows how to do that yet. So one of my next things is I got to teach somebody to do that so that I can take a vacation. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Oh, I know. Um, anecdotally, talking to a lot of my classmates as we have been maybe working part time at a church or in different internships, we're digital natives. So we're kind of being expected to know how to do technology more than some people with more church experience, more um, yeah. work experience in a full-time position. And that has been something that's sort of struck an odd chord sometimes is to be the youngest person in the room and maybe also the most experienced at something like Adobe. Do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, I, I do. I do. Um, so I think it's, it, it is a rub. It's especially a rub for some, um, for some leaders, I think, who think, who were taught maybe in an old school form of leadership or, yeah, I don't know, that, that, that they need to be experts at everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I just don't think that's true. And I, I struggle with this because I don't know if it is, um, uh, so I don't wanna overstate this point, sure. but I, I've heard someone say once that uh, your greatest strengths, your fully executed strengths are worth more to the organization than your marginally improved weaknesses. Hmm. Now, if you are weak in interpersonal relationships, work on that. That is not an excuse. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah, not yeah, like yeah. that is something that we all have to have a baseline at, right? You can't be like, oh, I'm really good at editing videos, but I'm a jerk. Like that, <laughs> that doesn't work, right? Yeah. Um, but if I'm really good at editing videos, but I can't sing a note to save my life, the last thing I need to be doing is going to learn to play the piano. Yeah. I need to be sitting down, figuring out how I can streamline what we offer online, how I can edit it better and how I can teach people what I know. Because to, for me to take someone who is a really good singer and teach them to do all that stuff is a waste of both of our times. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so it's okay to have a bit of a lane and stay in it. I think it's okay to have a bit of a lane. Now you may find that you're in an organization later on down the road, or maybe right now where the senior leader doesn't look at things that way. And sometimes you have to, you might have to think a little bit differently about it. But yeah, I think if you have a lane, stay in your lane, be humble, right? Be humble about your lane. Don't be like, oh, I'm such a good videographer, like, you know, sure. and help other people identify their lanes. So one thing I always say to our senior pastor is you have the best content in the Tampa Bay area. And I really believe that. Um, I, I really believe that he has some of the best preaching in the mm -hmm. Tampa Bay area, especially uh, when compared to some of the uh, non-denominational churches in the Tampa Bay area. He's got really good preaching. I said, you master your content and I will get better at capturing that content. Yeah. And so if he gets better at what he's good at and I get better at capturing his content, everybody wins. Yeah. But if he were to spend less time prepping his sermon so that he could record himself, you know, it's not gonna, we're not gonna um, be a better organization for that. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, we don't have to, try to be a jack of all trades yeah you know yeah it's and i i think a lot of people really will find a niche something that they enjoy doing that they're good at and it's great to be part of a team where other people enjoy and are good at other things mm -hmm. yeah 
it seems like you have a good team. Um, it might be helpful for people to know it's a rather large church, right? Yeah, it's a church that pre-COVID would worship a thousand uh, weekly uh, with probably, I don't know, 3,000 members. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. And a, and a staff. Uh, yeah, we've got two campuses, one in downtown Tampa and one kind of in a suburban part of Tampa. The weird thing is the campuses are only two miles away from each other, which oh. is weird in a multi-site sort of thing. Yeah, like multi-site is usually more regional. Yeah, <laughs> they're a bit more spread out. Uh, but actually, socioeconomically, they're two very different parts of Tampa Okay. Um, oh, I see. in just that two mile uh, change. Yeah. Uh, and we have a staff of about, I think, 30 full time people oh. Oh. Uh, and then 50 once you add part timers on. So sure. very large staff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you have the opportunity where some of yeah, if somebody's in a smaller church. They may have to get in a few more lanes. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Sure. Exactly. That makes sense. The other thing I think about this whole like way of thinking about like lanes or like uh, mm -hmm. jack of all trades or that kind of thing is um, uh, if you're doing something right now as a leader, if you're doing something right now that you're like, okay, this isn't my gifting, but it has to get done. This is where that maybe that job description on your desktop comes in handy because you can write that down, but you can also asterisk it and say, I need to find someone I can hand this off to. Yeah, I need to find someone who needs to be doing this. Yeah. There was a period of time uh, last year before COVID, well, two years ago before COVID in 2019, where a director of communications left. And I ended up uh, running the communications department for a couple of months. And part of that involved doing social media. And social media sucks my soul. Like it sucks <laughs> the life out of me coming up with content to put online and pictures yeah. and then tracking likes and engagement. So, so I was doing social media and it was just like sucking my soul and, and it felt like none of it mattered. And so one of the things I noted was once we get this under control, I've got to get social media off my plate. And what that meant is we ended up um, part time hiring a marketing company that came mm -hmm. in and basically handled social media for us. But the expense of getting a marketing company in there was worth the time and energy it was taking me to do something that wasn't in my wheelhouse. Yeah. If that makes sense. So again, sometimes as a leader, that might mean uh, um, offloading something that isn't in your wheelhouse as yeah. well. I think personally, that's been something took me a long time in leadership to understand is just because I don't thrive in a certain area doesn't mean it's not important to the organization. And I would mix that value up thinking that if, if I couldn't do it and do it well, then that must mean I think it's unimportant. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so I can see that struggle definitely in my career as well. Yeah. So through COVID, we're hoping to look to the future at the end of this, but like, can you just give us a little bit of an idea of where leadership has happened for you and for your organization during COVID and how you responded to it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, during COVID, uh, when we, when we pivoted online, we made a couple of really, um, big leadership decisions. I think that were mm -hmm. based out of our mission and our values. Okay. Um, so, so one of our values, and this is more of a cultural value our church. It's not one of our values that's on our website. I don't think is that we, um, it's not one of our values on our website. Um, we really believe in equipping lay people. Yeah. So we believe in equipping lay people to do ministry. So we have a lot of lay leaders in our church, lay mm -hmm. people run a lot of our executive committees, that kind of stuff. So when we thought about how to do online worship, we realized that we had an opportunity through the wonders of technology to invite lay people to record themselves in their own homes, reading the scripture and the prayer every week. So every week since April, the first Sunday in April, families have been recording themselves at home, doing the scripture or the prayer, and then sending that to us and it gets included in the service. We kind of clean it up a little bit, you know, but it's been really fun to see these families welcome us into their homes. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the joy, but then also the, the blooper reels that they'll send us sometimes with kind of sure. how many attempts <laughs> it took them. Um, but then we kind of amp that up for Advent because typically at Advent, we'd have families like the Advent wreath in the buildings, right? Sure, so yeah. I brought the Advent wreath to people's homes Oh yeah. and, and set the Advent wreath up in people's living room with their tree there, you know, with their chach keys, you know, it was like, it was like, this is my home and this is my family celebrating uh christmas yeah. and welcome and it was just so cool uh but that wouldn't have happened if we didn't have a value of equipping lay people right 
So that's why that's a place where we led differently. I'm not. I haven't seen any other churches uh, that are sort of producing at our level doing stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen churches that do that via Zoom, where they have like their their church meeting as a Zoom meeting. It's a bit smaller, and different people do different things. But I haven't seen churches that actually integrate lay people from their homes in the service uh, themselves. And then I would say another way we've led is um, we as the staff, we as the worship staff decided that the best way to do online worship is blended. And that is an insane, con once we realized that, we all looked at each other and thought, are we alive right now? Like pinch me, am I dreaming right now? Because we would never do a blended service in person, right? Like. You hear right. about those and, you know, that's like if you've taken a worship class in MDiv, you know, in your MDiv program, like typically they say, probably don't do blended. Nobody wins in blended. For some reason, it is working online. We're, we're, we're maintaining our engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not having to create two separate services each week, which would be a, a logistical nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was a leadership decision. Yeah. That was a decision that was leaders saying, okay, we cannot do what we've always done. We need to come up with a different option. And out of that need to make a difficult decision, leadership was required and leadership shined. Yeah. And so we ended up with a blended service, uh, which was a option none of us could have seen before COVID. Yeah. Yeah. And you usually have those services separate on time and not in location, right? Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Great. So the the reason I know you is yeah. through the Bible Project 2020. Um, can you talk a little bit about how and why you started your you as your church started this podcast? Yeah, definitely. So in early 2019, our senior pastor said, Hey, uh, me and a couple of the clergy are reading through the Bible this year. And here's the Bible we're using, and it's having a really big impact on us. I want the church to read through the Bible in 2020. And we all went gulp. And he said, I want to align <laughs> everything around this. And it was like, okay. So children and youth started thinking about what their curriculum would look like. Yeah. Adult discipleship started thinking about what small groups would look like. We made devotionals, we made study guides, we purchased a bunch of Bibles. Um, and then, uh, oh, also one of our core practices is reading scripture without fear or frustration. So okay. we want our people to learn to read scripture without fear or frustration. That was also an impetus for the Bible project. So we started doing it and I guess it was in, I don't know, July of 2019, the senior pastor comes to me and says, hey, um, also I'm, uh, I'm the only non-clergy person on our staff with an MDiv. So I'm not ordained. Uh, oh, I see, okay. I'm not ordained, uh, but I'm the only non-ordained person who actually has a seminary degree. Okay. All the pastors have seminary degrees, but sure. the only, uh, non-clergy person with a seminary degree. And everybody just knows I'm kind of a nerd there, or at least I kind of was certainly when I first got on the staff. I was well known mm -hmm. for my nerdiness. And he says, do you want to do Wednesday night lectures uh, every week of 2020 for the Bible Project? And I said, no, <laughs> because I have a young family and uh, Wednesday nights, I can't give up Wednesday nights for a year. And I thought, I can't lecture on everything in the Bible and I don't think that would be as interesting. I think we might get 75 people the first night, but as this would go on, I could see it dropping to a faithful 15. And at mm -hmm. that point, am I preparing a 30 minute lecture for 15 people? Now, that's not good. That's not good or bad. That's not a value judgment. It's more of just, is there a better way to get this content out there? And I said, what if we did a podcast? I'd never done a podcast before, but I'd listened to them and I thought we can expand our audience if we do this. Well, it took off. We made a, we got together a lay team of six people who would lead small groups, but were also kind of interested in Bible study, mm -hmm. came up with some parameters. Um, we wanted our episodes to be 15 to 20 minutes long. They ended up being more like 20 to 30 minutes long, but we came up with a list of scholars that we wanted to ask. Yeah. I dug into my connections from my, uh, from my MDiv at Candler, uh, and we just found scholars and we started doing podcast episodes. And I mean, we did 58 podcast episodes wow. in 2020, um, going through the entire Bible. Mm. Uh, and it was really cool to see these lay people who had never done podcasts, who had never gone to seminary, talking to scholars whose books they'd read in their classes, you know, or mm -hmm. 
uh, PhD students who knew a heck of a lot more than they did, but they were able to all find a common ground and then talk about scripture and make it in ways that were enjoyable to listen to, uh, but also helps the lay people who were reading through scripture understand it a bit more deeply, understand the key issues, the key uh, critical issues in the text too. And there was a tension the whole time between this is too nerdy and this is too basic. And how do we mm -hmm. find that in between? But that was a tension I was willing to live in. That was a yeah. tension that I think if we had controlled it too much, I think we would have controlled it too far to the basic level. And I think we would have really muted some of our scholars who wanted to talk about more critical issues in the text. So I think our lay people could rise to that level and have that conversation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. Um, the project seemed like it was really successful. Did you get a lot of reception, how people received it? Yeah, I mean, so metrics wise or analytics wise, it was, I would say it was pretty successful. Uh, we had uh, over two, over 200,000 200, downloads by the end of the year uh, oh. of individual episodes. So that was averaging anywhere from 3,500 to 4,000 downloads per episode, which I like to say we, you know, that was a broader reach than a Wednesday night lecture series would have gotten. Yeah. Um, and it was just really cool to see people tuning in from all over, you know, I mean, uh, what was cool too, is you would see that. So, so I started with my collection of scholars that I knew from Emory yeah. and then was branching out. And it was neat as I started to see the sort of, uh, the viral spread of it, you know, kind of yeah. going as people were finding out about it, you know, there was a big hub in Atlanta. Then there was a big hub in Minnesota for a little bit, the Northeast, you know, it was just kind of cool to see it kind of spread out. Yeah. Um, so it was fun. It was a really fun uh, project. It seems like it. And that has led us in conversation before to an idea of how will leading, especially technology in a church, look different after COVID. I, there are a lot of things that still seem unknowable about what life will be like once we're mostly vaccinated. But what do you think the church will look like? How will things be different? Yeah. So um, I think the church is going to... So. I want to tie this back to leadership. I think I think leadership is also uh, seeing situations that you're not sure you know the answer to, but yeah. entering into them anyways and trying to come up with a with a future, uh, you know, and the best future that you can understand in the moment. Uh, leadership isn't necessarily about having certainty, but about having clarity. So here's some of the clarity that I'm getting about kind of what the future might look like for the local church. I think we're going to be, if we can afford to do it, I think we're going to be content creators and content curators. Um, I think we're going to have a large online audience. I think every church, whether they wanted to or not, just created online campuses, not just online services, <laughs> but they've actually got online campuses mm -hmm. where people are attending from Ohio because they have uh, a granddaughter that lives in Florida who sent them the service. And now they come to the service every single week they're a member of the online campus, right? Yeah. And when we put content out on our Facebook page, they're always watching it. So yeah. our reach has broadened. Now that doesn't mean that we need to now all of a sudden have an evangelical mindset where we're gonna go uh, proselytize to the world through the internet necessarily. Now if that's your mission, if that's how your church is set up, by all means, go do it. And COVID has given you every excuse, has given taken away all your excuses for doing it, yeah. right? Like we all know yeah. it's possible. But for our church, I think one of the places where we're trying to lead is creating really good community in the online space. And for us, we're wrestling with um, how do people consume content in the COVID era and beyond? And what I mean by that is right now we offer our online service at 9.30 and 11, 9.30 and 11 on Sunday mornings. But spoiler alert, I've got that thing put together and ready to go by end of day on Friday. So there's a service ready to be distributed by end of day on Friday. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to distribute it Saturday. Sunday can still be the day that people do church. I still think that's yeah. people's rhythms. Yeah. But what if the service became available on demand at 7 a.m., but then we had watch parties and hosted viewing experiences at 9 30 and 11 so there could still be a gathered community watching it together at 9 30 and 11 but that family with three young kids 
that's trying to just get them up and get them breakfast would have the ability to put that service on in the background at 7 a.m., yeah. right? So they could still be experiencing it, be a part of it. And there's some people who would say, well, yeah, but those people are just consuming it. They're not in community. Well, they're not, maybe not in, com in worship communally, but there are so many other ways to be in community in the local church. And so one of the things we're talking about is how do we create pop-up small groups mm -hmm. that are 15 to 30 minutes long where people can hop on a Zoom call and discuss the worship from that Sunday and the sermon from that Sunday. And it could be, you know, Sunday evenings, maybe later in the evening, once that family with three kids has now put those kids to bed. If the husband and the wife want to talk about the sermon, but want to do it with another group of people, they could hop on a small group call at nine o'clock at night. Sounds late, but actually, or 830, you know, but once you've got your young ones in bed, you might find that you want to have a glass of wine and talk to some people from your church about the sermon that week. And you could have pop up small groups that happen on Zoom. And that wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, I'm in a small group now. That's just an option for someone to connect. And then they could then get into a small group from there. I, I liken it to what Netflix has done to our culture in a lot of ways, right? We've all seen The Queen's Gambit or Bridgerton, and we can talk about it. And we can have really in-depth conversations about it. And we can actually find affinities mm -hmm. through what we liked and didn't like about that uh, show. And we could get into... The next step is we can get into community groups where we actually talk about the content of that show or another show or something like that. But in the church is a bit broader, yeah. right? We're not talking about just serialized series. We're talking about the, the yeah. word of God. But I think yeah. the word of God can learn a lot from the way that services like Netflix are kind of getting people together talking about similar content. Right. Right. So I see I see new small groups popping up. Um, I see churches creating all kinds of content like podcasts. Um like midweek live videos from the pastor, mm -hmm. you know, uh, taking parts of your service and sort of uh, breaking them up. So you have, you know, you put your sermon out separately. Maybe there's a great piece of music that the choir did. You put that out separately. You know, all this kind of content for people to consume and share and, you know. Talk uh, about. <laughs> yeah, and talk about. Yeah, connect Definitely. Over. Definitely. That is how I have grown up doing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll definitely send my sister a video and we'll chat about it a bit after, even even if it's not like face to face or or over something like Zoom. Yeah, this is a great idea. I I see a lot of churches doing that and it leaves avenues for different types of expression that I think could get left off of a Sunday morning, like a yeah. podcast or like art even. That's right. Yeah, that's really right. a great way to deliver content. And like you said, curate. We don't necessarily have to be creating all of it. Right. Yeah, you can definitely shine a spotlight on on important issues in, diff in a different way. Yeah. yeah, that's a very encouraging um, way of thinking about technology and how we can approach the future with some confidence and some hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think that so if it's like it, someone else said, I'm so sorry. I just I think this might be my final thought. Okay. Someone else said that uh, chaos is what draws out good leaders. Oh. Chaos is where leaders kind of rise to the top. Yeah. Um, it's a just it's just a defining moment for people. And so I think, you know, this podcast is about leading in turbulent times. We're finding that these times are requiring people to hone their leadership skills. Yeah. Not just to have great ideas, but to then lead those great ideas into realization. Yeah. So how do you know, so how do you take what you might see as a good preferred future? for your local church or your organization? And then how do you lead that organization towards that preferred future, yeah. I guess? Yeah. So ultimately, even in, even though we're leading in turbulent times, ultimately still hopeful. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Matt, so much for joining us for this series on turbulent times and our leadership in it. Um, we appreciate the time you took today. Thanks, Monica. It was it was real fun. It was nice. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. And thank you for watching our Yale Divinity School series on leadership in a turbulent time. Thank you.